Video two opens with a discussion about the interference effect, which leads into the topic of how to incorporate high intensity interval training into a concurrent training program. As a coach or a trainer, one of the biggest jobs is to design a program that meets the demands of an athlete's sport or intended outcomes. In this segment, Dr. Larson discusses how to reconcile the potential impact of the interference effect of high intensity interval training with strength training or other sports specific training programs. It then moves into the very important discussion of the physiological targets of HIT. Dr. Paul Larson explains that every HIT template impacts three main physiological targets, the aerobic system, the anaerobic system, and the neuromuscular system. The remainder of the discussion surrounds how to target these three physiological factors to provide optimal athlete outcomes. The last slide there kind of kind of alluded to it that there can be this interference between you know metabolic conditioning or hit training and the strength or speed training that you might be doing. Again, you know you might there's so many of our different sports over here that require elements of both. You need strength or you need speed and but you also need the fatigue resistance as well that you're going to generally get from your metabolic conditioning or your hit training well how do you blend sort of both of those so we for that we um we, we brought in an expert in the world dr jackson fife from deakin university uh who you know he researches this topic and he wrote the chapter six for us you can see incorporating hit into a concurrent training program I'll, I'll just I'll do my best to do the do the topic justice for Jackson, and um, here's just I guess you can imagine you've got your you know aerobic conditioning or you know even your your metabolic conditioning on the left hand side here, right where we know that when we perform endurance training, even endurance hit you know imagine on a bike you're you're going to be doing things where you're increasing O2 delivery, increasing the O2 uptake at the cells. You're um, you're making new mitochondria, so we you know that's generally what happens when we do an endurance or aerobic conditioning. When you're in the gym, you're generally looking at things like muscle hypertrophy. You're trying to get stronger. You're trying to develop more power, and these are just not really com compatible co types of training. They're totally, totally sort of different. And there's often um, this thing called the interference effect that occurs. If you're blending these two types of training beside one another, it um, in the literature, generally speaking, the outcome isn't, um, isn't typically as great as if you were going to independently do endurance training or independently just do strength training. If you're just going to do one versus the other, you would, you would um, you know, see larger benefits of either one that you typed of uh, that you emphasized um, you know a little bit of kind of common sense is what you what you think but we really want the best of both worlds so often in our um, our team sport context uh, and many other sports as well so how do you blend them appropriately so we talk a little bit about the you know, this um, there's there's I guess a couple different philosophies for why this occurs and I'll just go through them briefly there's an acute or neural mechanism that Jackson explains, and it's basically due to the fact that there, with you know, whether you're going to be doing a hit session, uh, a, a typical hit session, whether it be bike or run, or whatever mode of exercise, um, it, it, you're going to get this residual neuromuscular fatigue from it. You're going to get sore muscles. You're going to feel yeah. You're going to feel tired. Okay, and you know, you know that is, I guess. Um, you know, uh, I guess incompatible with the same types of fatigue that you might experience in the uh, in in the gym as well. You're also going to experience, um, you know, potentially comp, uh, you know, some sort of fatigue as well as well within within the gym setting. So this type of fatigue acutely will compromise the strength training performance. All right, and that's going to also attenuate, lower the strength training adaptation. All right, there's also another mechanism that's described as the chronic or the molecular mechanism, and that is that there's there might be something you know again when it's prolonged, these signals actually that occur within a muscle might not be 
ideal. And again, you might get lower adaptations accordingly. Regardless to what, what occurs, there we know that um, there's some sort of thing that's going on. I think there's probably more evidence for the acute or neural mechanism. And that really leads to our, our recommendations that are coming up here next, because ultimately what we're gonna, gonna lead to is that we need to pay close attention to how much residual neuromuscular fatigue is actually occurring in either a strength training session or a hit, a hit session. Yeah, so you guys so often refer to the performance puzzle, um, which, you know, we'll get this great visual of it later on in this uh, web webinar. But one thing that you say in your text is that, you know, while these, uh, you know, the interference effect can attenuate strength training adaptations or compromise strength training performance, the reality is a lot of people out there training uh, in both in both methods do so because they their sport calls for it or because they need to. So the the art of the science and the art is kind of bringing that science over and making sure that you do what you can to hopefully minimize the interference effect. That's right. You've got that's a really good point. You've got control on that schedule, or you sometimes um, can have some control or influence on that schedule. Um, at least you know you may or may not. So what are the you know possibly through discussions with your coach that is controlling those sorts of things you can, you know, you can really have a look at your whole overall program and try to make subtle adjustments. So what are some of those subtle adjustments that you could make to try to, um, I guess, optimize the adaptation and not have that interference effect occurring? So the key one that Jackson recommends is to limit the neuromuscular fatigue to within at least six hours between sessions, some, you know, sometimes 24 if you can. So in other words, and you can look at that from either end of the spectrum both of the strength and or, and, or the uh, endurance conditioning one. So if your endurance conditioning session, um, sorry, metabolic conditioning session has uh, an element of neuromuscular fatigue in it, make sure that there's at least a six hour window between the strength session. If you, if it can, if it's sort of possible, preferably, you know, uh, if it's excessive, you probably want to even have it on the next day. Um, I guess conversely, you could also, you know, do types of hit sessions. We're going to explain what those are in a bit that actually lower the amount of neuromuscular um, fatigue within them. So we, as I'll show you shortly, we can actually form hit sessions that are low in neuromuscular fatigue. Pretty cool. That's the neat aspect of, of, of hit. So low hit, low demand hit, you can actually form to place those in front of uh, or after the, the strength training sessions. Um, you know, some of these also includes using soft surfaces for running like grass um, or limiting the changes of direction that are within um, running, tr run training within the team sport context. Okay, so for example, you could have a, you could, you could do, um, you could have a bike session placed in front of it, uh, a hit, a, um, a strength training session as opposed to some sort of team sport drill that would have a lot of changes of direction that would be eliciting a lot of neuromuscular fatigue. Uh, and you, you know, you, you'd want more of the bike session before the, the strength training as opposed to the, um, I guess the one with all the high changes of direction. Oh, interesting. Does that make sense, it makes perfect sense. Yeah. And then, you know, kind of going back to the low demand hit, um, one thing that I was reading is that, you know, the high intensity, right? Like you said, for this purposes, we're calling, hit metabolic conditioning, right? When we're talking about concurrent strength training programs, um, mm -hmm. you know, these metabolic conditioning sessions performed in the 24 hours prior to strength training sessions should be lower neuromuscular demands with like lower absolute or relative work intensities, um, but it might need to be longer. Is that kind of the thought? Yeah, I think absolutely. And I think that really leads us to our, you know, our next section here where we, we kind of we're stepping back. We're, we're moving forward in the context of, uh, I guess, the, the listener that is probably mostly interested in the, the concurrent training. And we're going to move back here and just appreciate a little bit more the different physiological targets of HIT, metabolic conditioning. And we're going to learn how we can just manipulate HIT sessions slightly to, to get different degrees of aerobic, anaerobic, or neuromuscular strain within them. So this is as simple as we can kind of make it. Right. Um, in, in terms of the HIT training, so we break it down into three physiological targets: aerobic, anaerobic, and neuromuscular. 
Again, the cool thing with HIT is you can form the session so that it targets uh, different elements of those three key physiological systems. Let's just re recall what those systems are or, or learn what those, those systems are. So you've probably heard of the aerobic energy system. So, and typically when we look at the aerobic energy system, we're talking about the heart and the lungs and that their, their maximal ability to, I guess, uptake and deliver oxygenated blood to the working muscles and, and the brain as well to, to elicit performance, right? Time at VO2 max is a cardinal marker of that. But yeah, we're going to be increasing things like, you know, the aerobic enzymes and the mitochondria um, through the, the lower deoxygenation levels can also, um, we also have to appreciate cerebral deoxygenation, you know, that the probably influences how um, training is actually felt. The other, uh, the second important physiological target is the, are the lactate, lactate sessions, your anaerobic system. So these are done without oxygen, that anaerobic system. And you, they're going to elicit a lot of lactate. And we're burning sugar in these sorts of sessions as well. So large anaerobic contributions. They're depleting our glycogen stocks. They're making training feel hard. And they're typically um, uh, associated with lowered performance uh, in sessions. So placement of that anaerobic component in the, in the programming puzzle around programming needs to, needs to be taken into consideration. And then finally, think of the neuromuscular um, component. So just have a look here at this hockey session where, you know, this is from my homeland in, in Canada, we've seen lots of, lots of hockey, where, um, you know, just think of the neuromuscular musculoskeletal strain if you're an athlete that's doing one of these sessions. That's the MOXIE monitors are actually mo measuring the deoxygenated uh, uh, blood level in the muscle and you can actually so you can actually gauge on, how much um, deoxygenation that actually actually occurs and but yeah large residual fatigue in a session like that and you can imagine how that's going to feel if you're going to continually to you know sort of repeat that type of type of training so we've got to appreciate the neuromuscular component again back to what we said before now imagine Imagine a bucket load of those, and then you're going to ask your athlete to do squats in the gym after. It's just not going to work very well. So again, so you need to really always appreciate that neuromuscular uh, component. And so, those um, and those templates that you first showed us in the beginning of this presentation, um, they all carry with them varying degrees of aerobic, anaerobic, glycolytic, and neuromuscular demand, and that's what makes them different. That's right. That's right. And this is the cool thing about HIT is that we can be very precise, like a Navy SEAL, like our like our Rambo, where we can actually have, you know, um, we can form HIT so it can have components of aerobic and neuromuscular. It can be formed where it has just components of aerobic and anaerobic, or we can we can have all three different systems uh, forming as well. So you'll see that color code sort of throughout uh, throughout the the HIT science, um, you know, formulas ultimately. Right. And then not, not all, and something that you guys make the point of is that not all systems, not all three of the systems need to be targeted simultaneously. And in a programming context, um, that, that can lead to, you know, some, some fallout physically and stress-wise if you tend to target all three simultaneously. That's right. Yeah, we often, we, you know, we, we say that this one is sort of our, where, we, you know, these are the type fours. These are often considered our weapons of mass destruction. So if you're always doing hit sessions that are targeting these three, you're really going to run into that uh, so-called overtraining type syndrome, right? Or, you know, potential injury risk. So, but if you're, you know, if you tailor your hit session, you can have, you can be targeting the adaptations that you're after to elicit the, the, you know, the development of those systems and saving the other ones, right, so that they can kind of recover. Again, just the, the really cool thing about HIT, and that's what you, you know, we learn from this. Right, and you can elicit the same program responses that you intended uh, without stressing all three of those systems over and over again, which is probably a pretty common mistake, I, I would say, unless that's, is that fair to say? Oh, I, I would think so, yeah, for sure. Like. Yeah, I mean, there's many programs that are out there that are pro you know, probably going a little bit too hard too often and don't aren't really considering these aspects. Uh, the individual learns because eventually they, they run it, wind up being a bit of a train wreck, right? And um, so if we're a little bit more, you know, more intelligent with our programming, 
we can, you know, we can ease off on some of these um, these aspects and program a little bit more intelligently and, and elicit a better uh, outcome or um, preparatory sort of uh, position for our athletes. Right. And this is where your weapons come in. It's where the weapons come in. That's right. So <laughs> many weapons. different ways that we can skin training. So, yeah, it's kind of moves us to chapter four. And this is going to, you know, seem a little bit complex when you first look at this. But these are all the different ways that we've thought of over the years that we can um, form our training sessions. So we go into, you know, admittedly, we go into some detail here. But we want to, if we, all, again, if we can move back and just look at what's the key things that are important. It's, it's the intensity and the duration of that work boat. So, um, yeah, we, and the, you know, again, I, I recognize we're getting a little bit complex here, but this is where HIT training actually occurs. It, it occurs, remember, by definition, above your maximal lactate steady state, that threshold we spoke of. And at the upper end, we've got our maximal sprinting speed or our peak power output. That's as hard as you could go or as fast as you can move over four seconds or um, as, yeah, as hard as you could actually um uh, you know, as much power as you could actually produce over, say, four seconds. So, and you can see uh, all the different, um, you know, percent calibrations that we can have there. This is your VO2 max, or the power that's associated with VO2 max. Look at all the different uh, intervals that are sitting in there, all the weapons, like long intervals, short intervals, repeated all-out sprints, short sprints, repeated long sprints. And here's the important one for the uh, team sport practitioner or the coach. This is our game-based high-intensity interval training. Notice that we can, depending on how we form our small-sided games, we can hit any number of these sorts of uh, these sorts of targets of, of high intensity, and that probably leads us, I guess, next year to you know what are we actually hitting when we hit these exercise intensities well we're one of the key things that we're hitting are our um fast twitch muscle fibers right these are big powerful motor units or or muscle fibers but they're very fatigue they you know they don't have good fatigue resistance they fatigue very fast as you can see there Conversely, my, um, you know, my, my triathletes, they have a lot of these slow twitch muscle fibers that are very fatigue resistance, resistant and they can go forever, uh, but they're not that powerful. Um, and here's our intermediate ones. And these ones are very, I guess, almost the best of both worlds. And this is ultimately, I guess, a little bit what we're trying to do with HIT. We're, we're targeting the fast twitch and the intermediate fibers and we're making them more fatigue resistance because that's the adaptations that you get when you when you hit those it um it, re it rebounds and recovers so these big powerful fibers are more fatigue resistant um so that's one of the key benefits of that hit training and just schematically it, we can actually see that in this power speed time continuum so here's that exercise intensity on the y-axis here is our critical velocity that's that threshold we spoke of that's that minimal threshold that we need to be above if we want to elicit our, a, a hit session. Okay, and yeah, th this this power or speed time continuum describes the interplay or trade-off of exercise intensity and duration. So you can go very hard, but um, not for very long, or we can go just above that threshold for, for much longer. And this is described as our um, so, so, sorry, the critical power was that lower intensity and the, I guess the anaerobic work capacity is that finite exercise intensity that we can do above that critical power, critical velocity. So this is, we often say that, you know, it's, um, you've only got so many matches to burn. You could burn that, burn that match off right away in, um, this tall skinny box. You could, you know, burn that match sort of slowly if you were just above that critical velocity or critical power. Okay, so many different ways that you can skin the cat when it comes to your hit session. If we're just looking at a single hit session. Right, and how how many times you would want to burn that proverbial match depends on, you know, your program, depends on the person in front of you. And then, of That's course, right. yeah. 
Yeah, and depending and depending on how you burn that match is is going to be, uh, de- um, I guess, forming the the weapon that we're trying to kind of get to here. So, and again, right. just to drive the point home here, here's an appropriately, and, and, and again, this is relates to the individual. So here's that W prime or that um, that that match that we're burning down, and we can we're burning it down appropriately in this top example but we can have too high of an intensity and we're burning it inappropriately. Note the that W prime falling down too fast. You know, the, note, note the um, diminished W prime and the, the you know, the, we don't have much battery left in our system or we can perform that hit session too long. And again, same sort of issue, right? Too, too long, same sort of issue. So, okay, you, didn't really, so you didn't really match the intensity to the appropriate duration in these scenarios? That's right. That's right. So the either in this case, the intensity was too high for the individual in panel B. Sorry about that. In in panel C, in panel C, we have the situation where it's um, yeah, it's kind of bled out. It's the hit session is going too long, right? It's, it's length and your your duration is too long. And again, in either case, for the individual, the W prime is is going down, and the, they're burning they're burning out all their matches, and there's no uh, residual energy left to perform another another session. Really, they can't really back that up. So the next, the other key influencing variable. And this is an interesting one, especially in the context of the team sport individual that is, or or coach, um, or strength and conditioner that's trying to optimize their, their performance is the recovery intensity. And I, and I bet that most practitioners and uh, coaches out there will believe that we need to clear the nauseous lactic acid um, so that we benefit our, um, our performance. And this is often something that we learn, at least what we hear a lot in the media. But is that actually correct? And here's, this is a neat little tip. So the answer is no, it's probably, it's, it's opposite to what you might think. And here's why, again, relates to this W prime concept that we're trying to learn. So though, again, here's the optimal session, green battery. We've, we've just, we've hit it absolutely perfect for this individual. It's, um, the match is being burned at the right, right appropriate uh, amount. But in panel B, we now have an active recovery condition. And note in this active recovery condition that we're still kind of bleeding out some W prime or maybe we're not allowing the W prime to kind of recover as fast as it would if we had left those cells alone and not taken out the oxygen demand in there, giving them a little bit more, uh, you know, re- repletion of myoglobin and uh, creatine phosphate and, and the like. Or if the recovery is too short, that's an, another another challenge. Okay, so let me just prove what I'm, what I'm, saying to you here. So in this study, this was the study from Greg DuPont and colleagues in 2004, where they looked at a 15 on 15 off session in team sport athletes. Uh, and so 15 seconds hard, 15 seconds off. And on the off, you could either go active or passive, but they wanted to go just, they, they told the subjects, go to exhaustion. Well, in the passive recovery condition, that is doing nothing, look how much, look, they went two times the length. They were able to do their hit sessions twice as long as in the active recovery condition where they're yeah. you know, half of the time. So if maximal recruitment is necessary, remember those fast twitch fibers that we're trying to target? If we want to hit those fast twitch fibers, you want to be emphasizing passive recovery because you want to repeatedly hit those. And you're going to feel a lot, lot better doing so in the passive recovery condition. If you are thinking that you need to um, flush out that lactic acid, and you've got a fairly active recovery there, up to you know 60% VO2 max, for sorry 40, 40% VO2 max in this condition, which is pretty low, but notice that you're just not going to get the same maximal recruitment out there. So, very important principle for conditioning coaches um, to appreciate if they want to get a little bit more bang out of, out of bang for the buck out of their out of their training session yeah the working set for any any hit session it's it's only 50 percent of the equation then you have to consider the recovery as part of the working set really for for outcomes 
Absolutely, absolutely. So two is a clear opportunity here. Um, not saying you have to do one way or the other one, but if you want maximal recruitment, if like speed and you know fatigue resistance of speed is important for the athlete that's sitting in front of you, you want to really emphasize the passive recovery and typically like longer recovery duration so that you, you're getting back into those large fast switch motor units. However, if there's another, there's an alternate condition and I'm speaking to the practitioners, the strength and conditioners that they'll only get their team sport athlete from the coach, sometimes for like a 20, 30 minute session. And maybe in that context, aerobic conditioning might be the more important aspect. And in that condition, well, active recovery is probably the right, the right play because then you're going to be actually, you know, aerobically conditioning them. So again, we're right back to what uh, you spoke on before there, Natalie, with the context, the importance of the context. So again, where knowledge is power, if you got that knowledge, you can skin that either sort of way, depending on, um, yeah, depending on what you're, what you're trying to get out of your session.